This is Image, a self-hosted photo backup solution that you can run on your Windows, Mac, and Linux machine. You can upload photos directly from the app on your phone, or if you already have a folder or hard drive that has a lot of photos, you can use a feature called external libraries which I'll talk about later in the video so you don't have to upload everything manually again. And you can also manage the folder structure yourself. But now I'll just quickly go over all the main things Image has to offer. The first thing you'll see is the timeline which shows you all your photos and videos chronologically. And in the left, if you go to explore, you'll see a list of all the faces that Image has detected with facial recognition. And you can speed this up with the NVIDIA GPU if you're running Windows or Linux. And then right under it, you can see all the places that these photos are taken from. And this will only work if the photos have location metadata. If you have photos that were sent through messaging platforms, they probably removed that metadata, so a lot of your photos won't have the location data. But if you took the photos yourself, it probably will be there. Now you don't have to look at all of your locations from here, you can also look at the map. Image will show you all the photos and videos that have location metadata, and you can see them all on one map. And the best feature in my opinion is their smart search. If you wanted to search for something like the beach, you could just search that and it'll show you all your pictures and videos that look like they're taken on a beach. Image has run all these photos and videos through machine learning, and it can tell what's in these photos and videos. And it's all running locally on your system, so you don't have to worry about privacy. And if there was some text in some image, it would be able to recognize that and you can search for that with the search bar, and it should show you that picture. And to access this image server from outside of your network, you can install a VPN server like WireGuard, so you can remotely and securely access the image server. And I show how to do this in Docker, and I made a video on it. And I'll leave a link in the description and in the card at the top right. So those are all the main features of Image. So to install Image, we're going to be using Docker in the command line. And if you don't know how to install it, I made a video on it, but it's pretty simple. All you need to do is paste a couple of commands. And on Windows and Mac, you just download one desktop app. So I'll leave a link to all the download instructions and my video if you need it. Now what I'm going to do is SSH into the computer that I'm going to install image on. Now open up any web browser and then go to image.app and then go ahead and click on docs. It should be at the top. Click on install and we're going to be using the all-in-one community edition. This way of installing it is supported by the community but it is a lot simpler than the actual way. It makes the docker compose file a lot simpler. So go ahead and just click on the github repository. And then scroll down and you should see a docker compose file, something like this. I'm just going to copy this for now. So we're going to need to make a compose file to paste whatever we just copied from the github page. And I'm going to make a folder. I'm going to make a directory and just name it image underscore server. Now to enter that we type cd and then image underscore server. You can put this anywhere you want. Now to make a file, this command should be available on basically whatever device you're using. Just do nano and then compose.yml. That's the name of the file. Now in here, you can just right click and paste whatever you just copied. Now I'm going to scroll all the way to the top and then we will need to change some of the options. So right now we'll be editing the environment variables that will be passed into the image container. And it's going to ask us information about how to access the database and the Redis server. There's two more containers that will also be running with image. And it's already in this compose file. First for the time zone, just set that to whatever your time zone is. This is what you'd put for the Pacific Standard Time. Now for the host names, instead of using the IP address, we can just use the name of the Docker container. Now I'm going to name the container Postgres underscore image. And Postgres is the name of the software that runs the database server. And for the username and password, you can leave it as the default. And don't worry, because the Postgres and the Redis containers, they will not be exposed to anything except for the image server. So nothing can be hacked because it's not really exposed to any other network. And then the next thing we're going to change is the Redis hostname. I'm also going to make this Redis underscore image. And then we'll change that later when we scroll down and we're editing the Redis container and the Postgres container. Now leave all of these as default. Also, I forgot to mention, if you want to use your NVIDIA GPU, I think that's the only GPU supported at this moment. On Linux, you just need to paste a couple of commands in the terminal to install the NVIDIA container toolkit. On Windows, the first thing you need to do is just install an NVIDIA driver, and you probably already have one. This will automatically install the tools necessary to use your NVIDIA GPU in WSL, which is basically your Linux VM. So just go to the GeForce Experience app or the NVIDIA website, and download the driver, and then it will install the NVIDIA container toolkit automatically. You will need to add this variable to your environment variables. So to do that, you just click enter over here. You can click space six times, and then once you put a dash and then another space, 
Then you can paste this, which I'll leave in the description. Now image knows to use your GPU, but it does not have access to your GPU until you paste another thing from the description. In the description, I'll leave all of this. You just copy this and paste this here. And this will pass in your GPU into the Docker container. And you need to make sure the indenting is right or else it will not work. Over here, there's two tabs, which is the same thing as four spaces. And then each tab here is just two spaces. If you have multiple GPUs, you'll need to uncomment this line and then put in the, the ID of the GPU that you want to use. I'm not sure how to get that ID, but I guess you can just try from zero to how many other GPUs you have minus one. Because the index starts at zero. And then if you're going to put the specific device ID, then you would need to uncomment this line and then comment this line like this. But since I only have one GPU, I'm just going to comment out this line and then leave this uncommented. And now we'll be editing the volumes. And what a volume is, is a shared folder between a computer and a container. So if you don't know what a Docker container is, just think of it like a virtual machine in the aspect that it is separate from your computer. So they'll have their own folders and files and everything. So if we want to save any data from the container, we will need to share a folder with the computer and the container. Since whenever a container is removed, all of the data is lost. So we need a permanent place to store it. Now for the configuration, I'm going to keep it in the same directory as the compose file. So to do that, we'll do a dot slash, and the dot signifies we want to stay in the same directory, and then config. So what this is saying is this folder config will be shared to the container, and it will be placed in slash config. So Docker will make this folder in the directory, you don't have to make it yourself. And I'm just going to do this for the rest of the volumes. Now I'm recording this while I'm editing because I want to make something clear. Image uses this photos folder to store the photos uploaded directly from the app you have to sync entire albums from your phone, which is okay since you can just create an album on your phone just for image. It automatically structures how the photos are stored in the photos directory. You can change how it is structured in the image settings, but the way I want to set it up is by having a directory which already has a ton of photos and videos that I have been storing for a long time over the years. And the best way to import that would be by using the external libraries feature. And it's exactly what the name suggests. You can just give image access to the folder with all your photos and videos, and it can automatically recognize when new things are uploaded to the library, which we will enable later in the video, on the webpage. And I will be manually managing this library with an app called Owl Files, which lets me access the server storage from my phone. If you want to know how to set up a network attached storage, I do have a video on that which I'll link in the card at the top right and in the description, but it is totally fine to just let image handle all the structuring. You do not need to set it up like me. If that's the case and you will not be using an external library, you can just remove the import volume if you want. But if you are going to use an external library like I am, we're going to be changing this line to the location of your external library. So if you're on Windows and you need to access some drive, you can do slash mount and then slash the letter of the drive. So if you had a drive with the letter Z, you would put a lowercase z. And then you could put the location of where all your photos are. And then on the right side of the colon, this is where we will be putting this in the container. So you can leave it in slash import, but if you're going to be having multiple external libraries, maybe for like other users too, you can put this in like slash mount and then in like the same directory if you want. It doesn't really matter where you put this, it just can't conflict with any other directories. So just to be safe, put all of your external libraries in slash mount. And the RO at the end means read only, so the container cannot make any changes to this directory. And for the ports, you don't really need to change this. What this is saying is any connection that is sent to your computer on port 8080 will be sent to the image server on port 8080. Make sure you do not change the number on the right. This is what the image server will be listening to for requests. If port 8080 is already taken on your computer, then you can just change it to something else. So I'm already using port 2283 for my actual image server. So I'm just going to do 8080 because I'm not using that yet. Then we're going to go down and we'll be editing the Redis uh, configuration. In here we can comment out the port section because we do not want to have this exposed to our network. So I just put a hashtag in front of each line to comment it out. And then for the container name, this is what we set above in the environment variables. I set it to Redis underscore image. This is exactly what you need to copy and paste from the environment variables. And then that is all you need to configure for Redis. And then for Postgres, we're going to also comment out the ports because we do not need to have it exposed again and then for the container name we'll set it to postgres underscore image because that's what i set in the environment variables now over here you can leave everything as default 
but for this we're gonna need to make another folder so i'm gonna delete everything before the colon and then i'm gonna put a dot slash to make it in the same directory as the compose file and then i'll have it in a data folder then to save this we'll do Control x y and then enter now if you type ls you should see everything that is in this directory and there's only the compose file for now and then when we start this container up it will make all of those folders to place all the data in i'm just going to clear this now to start this up we'll type docker compose up to start it up dash d to run it in the background and if you ever need to restart it like maybe you pulled the latest version then you can put a dash dash force recreate at the end to make it recreate the container and you might also need to put sudo at the beginning if you need admin privileges but i already added myself to the docker group so i don't need to use sudo so i'll just click enter and then let it run now it should take longer than this but since i already have the images downloaded it doesn't need to download it again it can just start it up instantly the image container runs a couple of commands and those take a long time before the image web page starts up so just wait a couple of minutes and then we'll move on to the web page So to access your server, you're going to need the local IP address. And if you're just doing this on a normal Linux machine, you can just do hostname and then dash I with the capital I. And then it should show you your IP address. But I'm running Docker with Windows, so it is running it in a virtual machine, basically. So it doesn't have its own local IP address on the home network. So we will need to use the actual computer's local address. If you're on Windows, open up another command prompt and then you can type IP config. And then it will show you your IPv4 address. That's what you'll need. On Mac, you can just type ifconfig, and then you should see your inet address. Now with that address, I'm going to open up Chrome. For me, this is the IP address of the server. And then we'll do a colon, and then an 8080, since that is what we set the server port to be. It should be the number on the left of the colon. And then if you have to, you could put a HTTP and then a colon slash slash. But most browsers would just automatically put that there. And now it says welcome to image. I'm going to click get started. Now for the email, you can put basically anything. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be real. The way I have it set up is there's only one user, which is the admin. And then all of my family just uses that account. We don't really need to make separate accounts for each person because we're only going to be contributing to one library. Just know that you can create multiple accounts in the future for normal users. So I'm just going to name this admin and then sign up. Now we're just going to log in for the first time. Then just go through the setup. Image will make use of this storage template when you upload your images through Image, like by syncing your albums. You can enable this if you want to. Now I'm going to click Done. And you'll see there's nothing here because we didn't add the external library yet. We're going to have to click on the administration at the top right. And you should see the option called external libraries over here. Now we're going to click on create library. The library owner, this is just going to be the admin. So just click the three dots and click edit import path and then add path and then we'll put the location of the shared folder inside of the container. We won't put the location where it is on our actual computer. The container has access to the shared folder with the location that you put on the right of the colon. So for me I did mount and then Z. Click add then I'll click save. And now to start scanning we'll click on the three dots again and we'll click scan new library files. If you click on jobs at the left, you can see what the image server is doing. So just let it run like overnight or something, especially if you have a lot of photos and videos stored up over the years. And then after you notice that everything is finished running, then you can go ahead and try looking at the photos and videos and then everything should work. Right now the thumbnails and stuff won't show because it's still doing those tasks. And there's also one important setting that you need to change in settings. So go over to external libraries. And then make sure watch external library for changes is enabled and then click save. So whenever you add some more photos and videos, it will automatically detect that. And there's also a periodic scanning, which has always been there and it scans at midnight and this won't take a long time. Only the initial process when it's doing facial recognition, generating thumbnails and stuff like that, that's going to take a long time. But if it's just scanning for new photos and videos, it will only need to add thumbnails and do facial recognition and stuff like that for the new photos and videos. So that will happen a lot quicker. So you don't need to worry about this running every single day. So basically, that is everything you have to set up on the image web page. Anyways, that is how you set up image on any computer. If you run into any problems, just leave them down in the comments and I'll be sure to respond to them as soon as possible. Anyways, if this worked for you, please leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.